Happy birthday to us! Behavioral Health Today dropped its first episodes on April 20th, 2020. To celebrate our one-year mark, we're releasing five shows this week, one episode each day. Two will be brand new shows, and three will be some of our favorites from the past year. We hope you enjoy all of them, both new and old, and we're looking forward to year two of bringing you trending and relevant content in behavioral and mental health. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. It's great to have you with us. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and I'm joined today by Dr. Stephen Taylor. Steve is a clinical psychologist and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia, Canada. His research and clinical work has focused largely on anxiety disorders and related clinical conditions, including fears and phobias, health anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. He has authored over 300 scientific publications and more than 20 books. Steve, welcome to Behavioral Health Today. Thanks very much, Graham. Great to have you here. You know, today we're talking about the psychology of pandemics and the role of psychological factors in the understanding of pandemics and the preventing in the spread of infection. Steve, it said that the psychological fear of disease is more fearful than the disease itself, and the psychological contagion effect is always more far-reaching than the physical contagion. When we say that there's a psychology of pandemics, what are we actually identifying and referencing? Can we start there? Yeah, for sure. What we're talking about here is, well, just to back up a sec, As you say, the psychological footprint of pandemics is bigger than the medical footprint. And by that, I mean that far more people are impacted psychologically than the number of people who actually get sick and die. So that's it. And in in a very real sense, pandemics are fundamentally psychological phenomenon. A pandemic is just not some bug spreading throughout the world. The behavior of people influence a pandemic or determine its spread. So the behaviors of people just determine whether um, a virus spreads or whether it's contained. So things like international travel, for example, whether or not people uh, adhere to social distancing or perform hand hygiene, things like that. Now, we're seeing that today in an interesting sense. We're in the midst of seasonal influenza, which globally has been mild. And this is because of the behavior of people. People right. are wearing masks. So right. that, that's another uh, very um, <laughs> dramatic uh, indication of the importance of psychology in understanding and controlling pandemics. Very good. You know, you're talking about the psychology around it. What do you see in terms of our behavior, our relational interactions with one another, kind of our own psychology that's unique to pandemics versus other times? Mm-hmm. Just to put this in context, two years ago, 2018, at the centenary of the Spanish flu, I started working on a book called The Psychology of Pandemics. Uh And that's because no one had ever put all this together before. And that book uh, serendipitously was published in October last year, a few months before. 2019, yes. Yeah, before the outbreak in Wuhan. And it was one thing to spend two years writing about it. And it was a a surreal experience to see those actual things that I've been writing about unfolding in real time. But one of the curious things is all the, many of the things we're seeing in COVID-19 we've seen before in previous pandemics. Mm. Um, This is to get to your question, things like the rise of anticipatory anxiety ahead of any actual infection. Uh, And I think you mentioned that earlier, the the, the fear of it, the panic buying, the surge of the worried well into the hospitals or overwhelming call lines, the xenophobia, uh, the fear of strangers uh, and racism that unfortunately has happened before in previous pandemics stockpiling, people engaging in obsessive compulsive tendencies, engaging in excessive hand washing or excessive use of personal protective equipment. So that excessive anxiety at one end of the spectrum, but also at the other end of the spectrum are the people who think the whole thing is is exaggerated. And we're seeing this today with COVID. The the COVID deniers, the people who think that it's not a big deal if they went out and socialized and partied if they were sick. Uh, They believe that their uh, immune system is is robust against infection. They don't see it necessarily uh, necessary to perform hygiene. So those sorts of things, 
seen, and you know, interestingly, they are linked to belief in conspiracy theories. And this is something we've seen in all previous pandemics, the belief that some shadowy uh, malevolent uh, organization is behind the spread of disease. In the case of COVID, the conspiracy theories are identical to what we saw, for example, during the Zika virus pandemic. The idea that it was a, a manufactured virus that got out of the lab. Uh, yes. In America, there's a conspiracy theory that COVID was created by the Chinese as a bioweapon. Interestingly, in China, there's a conspiracy theory circulating that COVID was a bioweapon created by the Americans. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So those sorts of phenomena. But there are some differences between COVID-19 and past pandemics. This is really the first pandemic in the era of social media, of yes. digital interconnectivity. And what that means is that phenomena that we've seen in past pandemics, such as panic buying, proceed much more quickly. They snowball, like things go viral, images of people panic buying toilet paper rapidly go viral throughout the globe. And that perpetuates and strengthens that sort of yes. panic buying. Um, what we're seeing is a little differently this time around is internet trolls spreading um, malicious gossip and stories to provoke panic and mayhem. That yes. happened a bit during SARS, but not to the extent to which we're seeing it now. So those sorts of things. And the internet has accelerated and intensified things such as the mask rebellion, the resistance against wearing masks. Now, we're, we're seeing this now, although something like 85% of people say that they're cool with wearing a mask. They say, well, yeah. if it keeps myself and my community yeah. and my loved ones safe, sure, I don't like it. It's, it's uncomfortable, but I'll wear a mask. You know, yeah. Roughly 85% of people, and that's, that's pretty much global. However, there is a vocal minority of people, you know, roughly 15% people, the mask rebels, who say, uh, you're not the boss of me. I'm right. not going to wear a mask. And the, the harder you try to convince them, the more they dig their heels in. That's right. Now, this happened during the Spanish flu as well. In San Francisco, for example, there was the Anti-Mask League that was formed. And their reasons for not wearing masks then, so over a century ago, are similar today. They said, well, we don't believe masks work and we think masks are a violation of our civil liberties. Now, the difference is back then this Anti-Mask League just fizzled out because there wasn't a way to reach out rapidly to people. They yes. had to put, a, put up physical posters around and yes. ads in newspapers. Today, you just need to get on, on your favorite social media platform and blast out your information about your cause and suddenly it's spread throughout the globe and reaches potentially millions of people. So that's a bit of a difference between this pandemic and previous pandemics. Really, really unique, isn't it? You know, you're talking about the excessive anxiety, the anticipatory anxiety, the xenophobia that occurs. Steve, I know that we are wired for certainty and predictability because that brings us a sense of safety and trust. But in the absence of credible and even action-oriented information, people will make up their own answers to questions or the uncertainties that they have. And then what happens is that we see this spreading via social media, like you're referencing earlier. What are you seeing in terms of the psychological fallout or the psychological effects of pandemics on populations and individuals? That's a really important issue. Uh, one of the defining features and perhaps one of the most stressful features of pandemics, including COVID-19, is, as you say, the uncertainty. And the uncertainties persist. Early on, it was uncertain as to how far it would spread, the degree of contagion, who were the most vulnerable. Yeah. And our health authorities play an important role in that. If our health authorities are seen as being transparent and consistent and relying on science, uh, acknowledging yes. uncertainties, that can help reduce um, the level of anxiety in the population. But if health authorities or, or political leaders are seen as inconsistent or agenda-driven yes. or seem to whimsically change their mind over, over things who recommend prematurely treatments, for example, that undermines public confidence. You touched earlier on predictability and controllability. They're yes. two vital factors in managing stress and stress reactions. So people do ordinarily seek out information that makes a stressor more predictable and more controllable. And that's one reason why rumors arise. You can think about rumors as improvised news. So people are trying to make sense of an uncertain situation. And so rumors will arise. We yes. saw all kinds of unfounded rumors earlier on in the pandemic. There was one rumor, for example, that drinking alcohol protected you against COVID-19. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that was a rumor of people trying to make themselves feel safe. Oh, there's something yes. I can do. However, right. there was an unintended consequence of that. There, were, there was a spike in poisonings from alcohol. Oh, my. Now, 
uncertainty impacts different people to different extents. Yes. Um, some people have a very high degree of intolerance of uncertainty. So they mm. have a great deal of difficulty tolerating uh, uncertainties or ambiguities in their life. They are the people who tend to worry a lot. Yes. And um, getting to your issue, question of the impacts and the longer term consequences, we are finding evidence of what we call a COVID stress syndrome. And this syndrome, which I'll describe in a minute, arises in people who have pre-existing psychological problems, particularly people who have pre-existing obsessive compulsive tendencies yes. and pre-existing um, intolerance of uncertainty. And yes. there are five elements of this syndrome. The first is this worry about the dangerousness of COVID-19 and worry about coming into contact with surfaces or, or objects or things that might be contaminated. The second component is worry about the socioeconomic impact, the personal socioeconomic impact of COVID-19. And some of these worries are well-founded. You know, Will I be able to pay the rent? Will I be able yes. to buy food for my family and so forth? But some people worry a great deal about that. The third component of the COVID stress syndrome is xenophobia, the fear that foreigners are spreading infection. Yeah. And I could talk about xenophobia a little later on if you're interested, but the fourth component are, are COVID-related traumatic stress sy symptoms. That is nightmares, intrusive thoughts, intrusive images of news stories about the pandemic. The fifth component is compulsive COVID-related checking and reassurance seeking. Yes. So reassurance, checking the media, social media, checking their health. And we're thinking that this checking actually drives the traumatic stress symptoms. The more you check the media, would agree. The, more you, the more you go down that social media rabbit hole, yes. yeah. um, and the news media that circulate on social media tends to be dramatic. The more you go down that rabbit hole and consume social media news, the more alarming information you're going to be exposed to. Yeah, those, those five really stand out to me when I go back to the idea of the controllability that you mentioned and the certainty and the predictability that we're not feeling. We're not feeling safe. We're not feeling trusting. And so we're trying, typically driven by kind of a fight or flight response, aren't we? Yes. Where we're trying to make something in control. We, we want to do something, even if it means worsening, you know, a condition like seeking reassuring behaviors where we can begin to pair. The more I seek, you know, reassurance, the safer I feel. But before we know it, our whole life is about trying to seek reassurance and check things. And we get caught up in this kind of this labyrinth here unintendingly. But we're pairing that checking with feeling safe, but it's not really the healthiest thing for us to be doing, is it? Exactly. You're right. It becomes addictive, this reassurance yes. seeking. It becomes like a drug. And so we're wondering whether this COVID stress syndrome, whether it will just be time limited, like an adjustment disorder, that when the yes. pandemic passes, people's anxiety levels will drop and they'll return to pre-pandemic levels. But we're thinking that for some people, this will be persistent. Yeah. particularly people with pre-existing obsessive compulsive tendencies and pre-existing intolerance of uncertainty. Because as you know, the research shows that OCD arises from a gene environment interaction, the interaction between vulnerability genes and stressful life events. COVID is a stressful life event. And we're seeing an increase in OCD globally, actually, during COVID. And people with this COVID stress syndrome are engaging in compulsive checking and hand washing yes, and so forth. Are. Our concern is that after this pandemic is over, that this will become a chronic problem for some people. In, if they don't get treated, they will ha have chronic OCD and perhaps chronic post-traumatic stress symptoms. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say in other words, so these behavioral traits, these obsessions, the, the trauma secondary to this, this is becoming entrenched. And for some, it may linger in a very significant way. Indeed. I think it, it, it will for some people. Yeah. On the one hand, we know that most people are resilient to trauma and stress. That we're tougher than we give ourselves credit for. But on the other hand, about 15% of people in the aftermath of trauma do develop chronic problems. And so after this pandemic has passed, it's unclear whether the number will be 15% or it could be actually higher. Mm -hmm. people who develop long-standing psychological problems as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. When you're talking about the resilience and the traumatic stress that we typically can work through, I think we're more resilient and our ability for adaptation is uh, greater than oftentimes we give ourselves credit like you're talking about, but the prolonged exposure and the increased sense of, hey, there's no light at the end of the tunnel or we're not sure what the light at the end of the tunnel is, it, it can compound that. But when you talk about resilience and trauma, and when I think about exposure to in a long-term way, I'm thinking also about our, our frontline healthcare workers. A colleague and I, another psychologist, run a group for 
frontline physicians here in Hawaii where I practice. And we meet once a week and it's an arena for us to talk about what life is like on the front line. Things like moral injury, you know, decisions they have to make when the, you know, the, the hospitals are getting, you know, slammed or watching over the course of these months, how doctors who are the heroes now become kind of villainized because it feels like they're the ones that are causing things to be shut down. They're the ones giving us science and it gets confusing. And so just watching kind of the trends shift there. What do you see being some of the long-term impact for our frontline colleagues that are out there in the healthcare worker field? Just before I answer that question, I agree with you that healthcare workers are experiencing a, a lot of stress around yeah. things like moral injury and, but also shunning and stigma. Yes. We, we did some research recently. We're finding widespread fear and avoidance of healthcare workers. Yeah. Even, even the people who get out and cheer healthcare workers at 7 p.m., as is happening yeah. in many countries, it's one thing to stand on your safety of your balcony and clap for healthcare workers. It's a completely different thing to get into an elevator full of doctors and nurses. And many of these people who clap and cheer are terrified about right. coming into contact with healthcare workers. And yeah. during SARS, that stigma against healthcare workers was stressful and distressing where healthcare workers were being avoided, shunned, and even the family members of healthcare workers yeah. were getting yeah. stigmatized. Now, as for the long-term impact, we saw during SARS that many people developed chronic post-traumatic stress disorder uh, mm. as a result. And the risk factors included being put in, in quarantine, in isolation, which is stressful. And a risk factor was being a healthcare worker. So if you're a healthcare worker who becomes sick, I guess you're thrown into a role confusion and that becomes doubly stressful for you. So yeah. my, my concern with healthcare workers, if they don't get the proper support that they need, and that could be, the practical resources uh, and the emotional support. My yeah. concern is we'll see things like an increase in post-traumatic stress symptoms, substance abuse, burnout and depression yeah. and suicidality. So there's some of the big, big concerns. I agree. I agree. I'm already seeing some of those in the, in the, with the practitioners that we work with really kind of teetering on the lines of some things and really the importance of getting some services and a place to talk and to kind of normalize the things that they're going through. I'm also aware, too, that, you know, amidst all of this, our lives have changed very significantly, including the lives of our children, whether it be, you know, distant learning or online learning now, not being able to go to school, outside, play, their friendships. What are some things you're seeing or the research showing with regards to children? Are there some effective ways that you're finding that children can be best addressed and talked to mm -hmm. about this pandemic? But how the pandemic is affecting children, I guess, it depends to some extent on the developmental level whether they can understand the significance of what's happening. But kids are being impacted in all kinds of ways. To some extent, some of the older ones feel that they're being unjustly wronged. Yes. They've, they've lost the rituals that they used yeah. to have. They can't go to graduation. They can't go to parties. They can't hang out with friends. And some of them say, well, you older people got to do this. We're being cheated we deserve to go to our grad parties or our yeah. frat parties and so forth and things like that. So that's a stressor uh, relatively unique to young people. For a lot of children, one of the biggest stresses they're encountering is the confusion and stress about the return to school as schools start to get opened yeah. up. The yeah. frustration about online learning, many children find this difficult and, and boring and stressful and they worry yeah. about their grades. The stress of the home environment, many parents are trying to juggle raising children while also working at home, which yes. is stressful. And during COVID-19, there has been an unfortunate increase in domestic violence. Yes, there has. And that includes violence against children too, when you've got families cramped up in tight spaces, under stress, and you add drugs or alcohol to the mix, and unfortunately, bad things can happen. So for that sort of problem, of course, social services are important. More generally for parents helping their children deal with the stresses of COVID-19, I guess, you know, ideally you'd be the person who knows your kids the best and yes. you'd be able to identify when there's something wrong. Yeah. That, that would be the first thing to do. Look for warning signs that they're just not right. They might seem preoccupied. Uh, they might seem more irritable than usual. There might be an increase in temper tantrums or they might might be listless or, or it might be a loss of appetite. So yeah. identifying those, those warning signs and then every parent's different in their parenting style, but I think one good approach is to 
gently ask in a non-leading way what might be troubling them. Yes. Saying, you, you seem to be out of sorts recently. Is there something wrong? Is there something you'd like to talk about? So yeah. letting them articulate rather than you jumping in and assuming that you know what's wrong with them because it could be something you didn't anticipate. It could be something yes. like, I'm worried about losing touch with my friends yeah. because we're locked down all the time. It could be something like that. Or it could be, say, I'm worried about grandma. I'm yes. worried about my grandparents. When I go to school, I'm worried that I'm not around them, that they, they could get sick and die. So, right. you know, exploring that in, in a, um, a non-directive way that can help. Some practical strategies which work with many children are, you know, trying to set a routine as normal as possible. Yeah. For children now returning to school, the school is stressful at the moment because mm -hmm. it's a different situation. It's a, an unusual situation for them. And in some ways, it's like the first day of school all over again where they have to do additional things. They have to self-regulate. Yes. School is about regulating your emotions and your behaviors. And for young mm. children, that could be really difficult. Yes. And not only do they have to regulate their emotions, now they have to regulate additional things. They have to socially distance. Some of them have to wear masks. They have to practice good hygiene. So yes. the, the demands on their behavior has increased. So what that means is when they get home, they're more likely to throw tantrums. Yes. It's almost like you've been you've been trying to behave yourself and control yourself all day long. Yeah. And then you get home and bang, <laughs> let, <laughs> you're loose. let loose. Exactly. Yeah. So parents can deal with that by giving the children a little decompression time. Yes. You know, have a, have a snack ready for the young children when they get home or have a cuddle time or reading stories yes. for them just to decompress and de-stress before yeah. getting on with their homework. You know, don't demand a five-year-old do his or her homework as soon as they get home. Give them some, yeah. some chill time. The other thing that can be helpful is to be mindful about the extent to which they're consuming news media or particularly social media. If children are starting to have nightmares about COVID-19 yes. and so forth, it might be worthwhile limiting their exposure to disturbing news media or social media. Yeah, those are great points. I always feel that children are going to do as well as their parents are and how opportune a time it is for parents really to shape the message that their children receive to have some care and then kind of an empathic attunement to what they're, be, you know, what they're going through, going back to school, the transition there, coming home, decompressing. And as parents, as they get to think about what's going on, I also know that businesses are allowing folks to work from home or some to come in, kind of a hybrid, and others are allowed to go to work. Are there any actions that you see employers being able to take for the care and psychological health of their staff? It's a very much a juggling act. And I know that many small businesses, which were operating on a very thin margin to begin with pre-pandemic, yes. are now under severe duress and going out of business. So employers are under a lot of stress as well. Then they, they have these additional demands of having to cater to the special needs and yes. requirements of workers. So it's a tough situation yeah. for everyone but perhaps it can be helpful for employers to be mindful that their staff will be more stressed and, and fragile than usual. Kind of like the parent of the child coming home you're talking about. Yes, I agree. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. They, they could be more irritable, things like <laughs> that. And you may find that yeah. you, you're going to have to go the extra mile to accommodate the stress of your employees. And I guess it's either go the extra mile to try and accommodate them you might encounter problems with absenteeism or, yes. or people quitting their jobs, things right. like that. So, yeah, employers have an extra demand on them trying to accommodate people. Uh, yeah. And I guess this is going to be particularly challenging with people with COVID-related exacerbations in obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, agreed. You know, as we're talking about some of the signs and symptoms, you know, of things being manifest, I'm thinking about a, a colleague and I, the same one we do, the doctor's group. Where we've done some things on the local news stations about how to, you know, right size and normalize what's going on and how to understand the processes that we're going through, the grief and mourning process. We talked about some more existential fears getting kicked up during this time when we're required to be so isolated. We even talked about uh, mental health PPE, you know, how to gear ourselves up for in the same way our medical colleagues do. How do we do that psychologically? So let's, let's shift just a wee bit into what can we do? What are some of the successful ways that you found to combat some of these mental health issues either prevalent during a pandemic? It's a really good point. I think the important thing to start off is being proactive. 
of Agreed. starting to plan now what you might do if there's a second wave of lockdown, for example. So planning to come, we've all been through a first wave of lockdown or most of us have. So there's yes. the opportunity to ask ourselves what went well that time and what didn't go so well yeah. and what could I do better? And we're finding that the most distressed people in the last wave of lockdown were trying to cope by overeating, uh, abusing drugs and alcohol uh, or excessive shopping online. Yeah. The next step is looking for warning signs that you're not coping so well. Those might be finding yourself more irritable than usual, not sleeping well, an increase in drug or alcohol use, overeating, things like that. Or it could be as simple as, as your family or friends saying, hey, you, you don't seem like you're doing too well or you don't seem yourself. So identify the warning signs and then it's important to implement or try particular coping strategies. There's no one size fits all. Everyone is different. Some general strategies that seem to work for many people are trying to set a routine for yourself to try and keep things as normal as possible, to try and put things in perspective. If you're unable to go to work or unable to go to social gatherings, reminding yourself that social distancing is for the good of your community and for yourself and as a way of overcoming this pandemic, reminding yourself that this will pass. Yes. We don't know whether COVID will disappear like SARS disappeared or whether it's here to say, but the pandemic will pass. Yes. So that sort of thing. Interventions that work well for many people include you know, a healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, getting enough sleep, limiting your dose of uh, news media and social media. Obviously, we need to stay informed, but limiting your dose of sensationalistic media. Don't get all your news from social media. I suggest get it from reliable news sources. And of course, physical exercise, trying to stay active. And I'm, I'm hoping that if there's another lockdown, I'm hoping that it will be easier for people this time around because of what we now know about COVID-19. We know it's relatively okay for you to be outside so long as you're socially distancing. That's you right. need not be confined to your home. So if people can get out and do that, their stress levels would be lower. So there's some important ways of coping. And of course, it's important to listen to what our healthcare authorities recommend. You bet. Wear a mask, get vaccinated, wash your hands and so forth. Really good. You know what I like about all the things you just mentioned right there for whether it's a routine or normalizing what's going on, maintaining good perspective, complying with just really good, solid healthcare decisions, distancing, masks, hygiene, you know, there, there too, diet, exercise. These are all things that we can control. And we sometimes minimize that amidst times of feeling scared, uncertain, mistrusting. There are so many things that we can do. So my, my, my thought as you're saying is let's identify the things we can control, seize those. And the things that we can't control likely are going to go a little bit better for us as we do. I, I agree entirely. And that's been an issue throughout this pandemic, people trying to find ways of seizing control. And yeah. I think that was behind the panic buying of toilet paper early on. <laughs> panic buying, stockpiling was a way of people trying to seize control. That's right. They knew they were going to lockdown. They that's were that told- fight or flight, absolutely. Yeah, they were told early on that you didn't yeah. need to wear a mask. All you needed to do was wash your hands. And yeah. so people were getting this message, this <laughs> new scary virus is coming to town and you're telling me all I need to do is wash my hands. That's right. And so people were trying to seize control. So yeah. in, in the case of panic buying toilet paper, it was the illusion of control. Yeah. You know, buying, a, buying a big bag of toilet paper didn't keep you any safer, oh. but it gave you that illusion. But it's important, as you say, of people learning or finding ways of, of seizing realistic control over yeah. their lives and hand washing and wearing a mask and socially distancing are important ways of doing that. We know those work. Steve, we're kind of coming to the end of our time and I'm thinking right. about uh, just as we wind this down, any takeaways you'd like to leave with us that can shape our experience from what we're currently going through, what we're learning as it relates to not just getting through this time, but maybe even future pandemics. How do we as a society, individuals, find a way to shape our thinking about and approaching this pandemic? I'll start with something a little negative and end with something more positive. Okay. Uh, on the negative side of things, this pandemic is a wake up call to all of us. When this pandemic is over, there will be another one. It's inevitable. Yes. Uh, sure. Who knows, it could be in 10 years time or five years time. And there will be the impacts of climate change. And we're seeing that right now, we're seeing the intersection of pandemic and climate change. Here in Vancouver at the moment, it's, it's smoggy and this wildfire smoke. Vancouver yes. has been declared the city with the worst air quality in the world today. And oh that's my. all due to wildfires 
uh, south of the border and the, and the dust and everything blowing up here. And so they've got this intersection of the pandemic and the wildfires. And of course, on the East Coast of the United States, you've got the intersection of hurricanes and the pandemic. Yes. So right. after this pandemic is over, we will have the challenges of climate change. So I suggest that we use this pandemic as a learning experience. Agreed. Uh, on an individual level and on a community and national level to learn about what can we do to prepare our community for widespread stresses yeah. or disasters. And maybe one good thing that's come out of this pandemic is the rise of digital mental health services. Of, and I hope those services continue after the pandemic because we need those services. We need free evidence-based mental health services that people can access on their phones or their computers, that people can access in rural areas. So those sorts of things to help prepare us for the challenges ahead. The more positive thing is, has to do with the concept of post-traumatic growth. Yes. That, yes. that people can and most people do grow through the experience of adversity. And we're doing some research on this and we're finding that we, we ask people and about half of the people in our samples so far say, yeah, there have been some silver linings from this pandemic. Granted, it's serious and many people have died and very bad things have happened, but people have found ways of growing psychologically as a result of that. People are saying, I've learned to savor the little things in life I used to ignore or, or take for granted. I've learned to value friendships. I've learned that I can rely on people in my community. Yes. I've strengthened community ties. Yes. So there are those sorts of silver linings or ways of growing through adversity that, that yeah. hopefully will carry forward after this pandemic, that people will take those away and use them to enrich their lives. I really like that hopeful message. I know that, you know, when we talk about Kubler-Ross's you know, various stages and you get down to the acceptance. A lot of times people think, well, I just have to be resigned to accept something. But in that acceptance, there's actually freedom and control. And then we can look at this, what you're thematically talking about here is transcendence. Exactly. We can actually grow out of something that was very hard, very traumatic, very serious in our lives. But in this time, we're all creating a legacy, whether we recognize it or not. And we get to script, like you're suggesting and encouraging, we get to script what our legacy gets to be and author that for our lives. And ideally we're identifying the things we're controlling, like you're sharing with us today. And we're recognizing our own capacity for resilience, our ability to bounce and grow. So there is a hopeful part of this message, isn't there? Exactly. It, it may not be a, a simply a fact of going back to where you were before the pandemic. Yes. It may be becoming a better human being or a better community as a result of being through this ordeal. Wouldn't that be a great piece too, not just individually, but as our communities, as a nation? What if we come at it and we're changed in all those different levels and parts of our lives? So, Steve, as we're coming into a close today, I would love to have you identify resources that our listening audience can go to to uh, learn more about you, what you're doing. I know you've got a book out, came out in 2019, as you talked about, and other resources that you would recommend us being able to access during this time. Mm -hmm. There are lots of resources out there on the internet and they're growing all the time. Some of them are apps or web-based programs. Some of them are mainly research tools in early stages. Our website, which is coronaphobia.org, coronaphobia, one word, lists our research and some of the work we're doing, but also has a link for consumers where they can go and do a self-assessment of oh, COVID stress syndrome, where there are links to uh, mental health services, for example, links to some of the apps. There is a very good app by the Veterans Administration for coping with COVID and links to other sorts of mental health platforms. Now, these things are evolving, and so we'll be updating our website as it goes along, but we're focusing on evidence-based cognitive behavioral sorts of online treatments for people or resources. And so that's what I would suggest people do. Go to coronaphobia.org. Very good. Thank you. Steve, I sure appreciate being with you today. It's been a really great time interviewing you and kind of finding out just your expertise in the psychology of pandemics. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks very much, Graham. So nice to have you here. And as always, to those listening in, thanks for being with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.